dear Kenyans, wherever you are watching this event from across our nation. Your Excellency, 57 years ago, Kenyans made sacrifices for us to have the most important thing in life, that is to make decisions for ourselves and to chart our destiny. We have had a journey of 57 years and every generation and every government have had to grapple with tough decisions when faced with challenges as a nation. But in no generation and no government, Your Excellency, has experienced the kind of challenge the COVID-19 pandemic has caused to our country. Today, this celebration is unique. It's never happened like this. Today, Your Excellency, our schools are closed. Our places of worship are shut. Millions of Kenyans have had to leave work. Traders and business people have had their businesses affected. And our life as a nation and as a global community is upside down. To use the words of Mutai Kagwe, things are really abnormal. In fact, Your Excellency, while it was normal for somebody to cough, nowadays it is no longer normal. When somebody coughs, others step back and ask whether everything is okay. I remember the other day when I went back home uh, working from the office at the residence and inadvertently I stretched my hand to my young daughter to greet her. She told me, uh-uh, there is the sanitizer. That is how abnormal things are today. But when you called the nation to action because of this pandemic, the response from the Kenyan people was unprecedented. Every Kenyan stepped forward. Millions of Kenyans are wearing masks. They are cleaning their hands regularly. They are avoiding unnecessary contact. And people are keeping social distance. In fact, when I saw you march here, I was wondering why the parade was different today. Only that I realized later that there was social distance. So we've really changed. But Your Excellency, your intervention, as you mobilized government to provide guidelines, every Kenyan across this nation is now part of the big army to try and deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Your Excellency, as a people, we are confident that under your leadership, the Kenya government will take the necessary decisions. And I'm calling on leaders across the divide and Kenyans across the nation to work with you and government to make sure that we mitigate and minimize the effects of this pandemic as we work out the new normal. Because it looks obvious that there will be a new normal. It's not if, I think it's an imperative. And if we can fashion that new normal, then we can move into the phase of ensuring that we deal now with the effects how to open our schools, how to 
open our businesses, what kind of support we can give to our SMEs, and how we are going to open our places of worship. And Your Excellency, we are confident that under your leadership, we will have a new normal, and Kenya will move into the future the way we have, come, we have overcome our challenges in the past. Finally, Kenyans, Your Excellency, are praying. Kenyans are praying for you, Kenyans are praying for their government, and Kenyans are praying for our nation. Many spiritual leaders across this land are praying. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has made everybody realize our inadequacy and what God can do. Allow me to take this opportunity to salute you all and to wish every single Kenyan a happy 57th Madaraka Day, a day our founding fathers achieved the right for Kenyans to self-govern. We commemorate this day with fond memories of the struggle for independence and the birth of the Kenyan nation, and with it, the birth of the Kenyan dream. We are further emboldened by the fact that united in struggle, we managed to defeat a giant nation. And this leads us all to believe that even as we fight the corona pandemic today, our victory over our colonizers should remind us that here too we shall be victorious. Although, slow, slow, although slowed down by the health crisis and the economic downturn caused by COVID-19, I am further comforted by the teachings of our founding fathers. They instructed us to be our very best at our darkest moment. They taught us not to question in the dark the dreams that we dreamt in the light. And indeed, when our dreams hit rock bottom, they taught us not to abandon them, but to reimagine them instead. They told us that rock bottom is actually a foundation that you can build on. This corona moment we are in, yes, indeed, a dark moment. But the founders of our nation required us to be at our very best at moments like this. And this demand is not a lofty ideal. They themselves practiced it as they fought to bring us self-rule. Fellow Kenyan self-rule required dreaming hero heroically, embracing the unknown, an offering to die for an ideal. But this was not an easy feat. As thousands lost their lives at battle, the dream of Madaraka increasingly became nothing but a bridge too far. Yet in their darkest moments, our founding fathers did not abandon the course. Instead, they reimagined it. They regrouped and they re-engaged differently. Many died before they breathed the air of freedom, but many more lived to witness the flowering of a new nation. This gave them hope that the Kenyan dream is actually within reach and it was possible. Because of their faith and fortitude, they did fight the good fight and they won. And out of this, they gifted us Kenya. On this Madaraka Day, 
We thank each and every one of them for this gift and for their teachings on how to remodel an idea in the face of enormous challenges and raging crisis. Today, therefore, and all future Madaraka days, I call upon all of us to ponder the state of the Kenyan dream. And in pondering it, we must remember that Kenya is still a work in progress. Similarly, as we reflect on the progress we have made, as we look inwards for self-introspection, we must not over-criticize ourselves. And I say so, because in the subconscious mind, we become what we repeatedly do. If we repeatedly feed our national psyche with negative energy, we become an Asian of angry and frustrated people. Yet dreams cannot flourish in a negative environment whose main currency is anger and animosity. Fellow Kenyans, this Madaraka day, I want us all to reimagine Kenyan, more so because COVID-19 has forced us into a situation where we have to reset our national systems. But to reimagine our dream and nationhood, we must also reflect on our history, because history has laws that show us the future. We must begin by asking ourselves a number of questions. How was the Kenyan dream imagined in the very beginning? And how did we come to be? How did the original blueprint of Project Kenya look like? Let us make a historical inquiry in response to these questions. Fellow countrymen, two years after Madaraka Day, our founding fathers adopted sessional paper number 10 of 1965. It was entitled African Socialism and its application to planning in Kenya. This was the vision document for our young nation and was full of dreams for the future to come. It envisioned a Kenya with an Africanized economy, an economy largely locally owned, whose industries were producing for regional markets and in which technology was the light and heat of commerce. A nation that drew from itself for itself. This dream was further articulated by Jaramogi Oginga Odinga in his book, Not Yet Uhuru, that was published in 1967. The central theme of this book was that independence was not complete until the economy was in the hands of Africans. Jaramogi envisioned a Kenya that was unapologetic about its Kenyanness, a Kenya that could stand on its own feet in a world unfriendly to the African people, and a Kenya that is capable of enterprise and development in fields beyond our shambas. Then there was Tom Joseph Mboya, one of the other founding fathers, who echoed the dream. In his book, Freedom and After, he reminds us that great things are made of a series of small things. And that the making of a nation is the work of many small events and transitions, many small failures and successes. But Tomboya's main reflections were on constitution making. Having been involved in the Lancaster constitution making process in the 1960s, 
Boya cautioned the nation against constitutional rigidity. In particular, he argued that the Constitution cannot be useful to a country if it is an end in itself. A good Constitution must be responsive to the aspirations of a nation and be a means to a greater end. And if the political architecture provided by a constitution cannot support the growth and progress of a nation, that constitution becomes a cancer to the body politic. On his part, the founding father of the nation, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta, imagined a free Kenya as far back as the 1930s while at Manchester in the United Kingdom. His dream is painted in his books, Facing Mount Kenya, as published in 1938. And in this dream, he cautioned us that the seed of freedom will only take root if our mindset is focused on the right thing. In the business of building the nation, he warned that we must not focus on what has been done, for our focus should be on what remains to be done. And this is so because it is natural. Every time one target is attained, a new one becomes necessary and urgent. The right mindset is therefore a critical plank to making a dream come true. But Mzee Kenyatta made other assertions in his prison notes published in a book entitled Suffering Without Bitterness. Reflecting on his struggles while in prison, Musea said that if hope will sustain you through fire, faith is greater because it enables you to leap over the fire. The act, therefore, of imagining and building a nation from the bottom up must therefore be an act of faith. And faith, according to him, is the, is the act of letting God know your intentions, but taking charge of the methods necessary to achieve them. Fellow Kenyans, our founding fathers left us with deep teachings and convictions, and now we must summon the teachings as we reimagine re our nation today. We have achieved the dreams of the Founding Fathers as captured in Sessional Paper Number 10 of 1965 and revived in Sessional Paper Number 1 of 1986. Further, I believe we have made admirable progress in the implementation of our own Vision 2030 as my administration implements the Big Four Agenda. But truth be told that this vision comes to an end in nine years. So the urgency for a new vision, a new dream, is therefore real. Like Kenya in its 50s, the Holy Bible required nations to hit the reset button every 50 years. On the 50th year, we are told, all debts were forgiven, slaves were set free, and all land was left unattended. This action brought renewal to the soul of the nation, healing to the land, and a fresh vision to its people, and they called it the year of Jubilee. But for us, fellow Kenyans, to craft this new dream, and to prepare for the next great leap forward, we need to finish what our founding fathers had started. And this is what we set out to do in our quest, to uproot the remnants of ignorance, poverty, and disease in our midst. This inspired my administration's transformative agenda for the nation, the Big Four. And allow me just to give you only three examples of unfinished business started by our founding fathers and which we today are endeavoring to complete. The first one is infrastructure, the backbone and the enabler of any economy. 
and by this I mean roads, rails, ports, and so on. At Independence, we had only 1,800 kilometers of tarmac road. This is what our colonizers had built in 70 years, 78 years of their occupation between 1985, no, 1885 and 1963. This means that all their endeavors for 78 years, they only managed to tarmac a total of 23 kilometers a year. After independence, our founding fathers built an extra 11,200 kilometers of tarmac roads over a period of 50 years. This was about 10 times what the colonizer had done. But with better technology, planning, and efficiencies, my administration has built 1,000 kilometers of tarmac road every year. That is 45, 44 times more than one the colonial administration built, and more than four times what the first three administrations built collectively per year. Regarding ports, our founding fathers saw them as gateways to regional and international markets. Apart from the port of Lamu, which we have added to our number of ports and which will change regional trade dynamics, we have also re-envisioned the port of Kisumu. This port was built by the colonizers, but collapsed at some point. We have since, working together with local leaders, revived it for strategic purposes. Lake Victoria serves both the northern and southern corridors. And with this port, Kenya can serve the region from Mwanza to Bukoba in Tanzania, to Jinja and Entebbe in Uganda, to Muhoma Bay in Rwanda at affordable costs and decent timing. Beyond serving the region, the port is poised to also promote the shipbuilding and repair industry in Kenya. It will also catalyze the development of other small ports. And what I'm proud of most is that we did this revival with dead capital. And in this I mean, we redeveloped this port using local expertise and material. Turning to railways now, this is where my biggest critiques reside. But that is OK, for they are not alone. They are in fellowship with the colonizers who called our railway the Lunatic Express. But those who called it the railway to nowhere did not realize at that time that they were describing this great city of Nairobi. Nairobi, indeed, at the time was nowhere when the railway was being constructed. In fact, it was nothing but a swamp. And that is why Sir Charles Eliot, the man who supervised the building of the railway, observed, it is not uncommon for a country to create a railway, but it is indeed uncommon for a railway to create a country, end of quote. Nairobi and indeed most of our country were created by the railway. And that is why, apart from the SGR, I am also reviving the defunct Nairobi Nyanyuki Railway Line that trans transverses six counties. We are also in the process of rehabilitation of the Naivasha to Malaba meter gauge line, which is also about to commence. This rehabilitation of these central railway lines is part of a bigger development strategy to link the hinterlands, not only of Kenya, but of our region, with Lamu Port, our port in Mombasa. And that is why the Southern Sudan-Ethiopia Transport Corridor continues to remain important. I believe that when this happens, then Kenyans can expect new markets to emerge along these railway lines and new cities to blossom in response. The second example of unfinished business from our founding fathers regards the dignity of our people. The freedom struggle was about liberating Kenyans from the poverty 
of dignity amongst other freedoms. Three, to fight what the Founding Fathers called ignorance. My administration has carried out extensive reforms in the education sector to make it more competency-based and to allow our children to be better prepared for future jobs. We have secured the place of pride in the continent as the home to the highest transition from primary to secondary education on the African continent. Additionally, the technical and vocational training is taking root as we seek to reposition our human resource for the ever-evolving world economy. But the human side of these reforms has also focused on electrification. We have connected 99% of all our schools to electricity. And as we did this, we also realized that a substantial part of learning happens at home, even in better days. That is why we were motivated to do our last mile program, connecting homes to power. For the record, it is indeed worth noting, fellow Kenyans, that after 78 years of colonial rule and 50 years of independent administration, only a total of 4.5 million households in Kenya were connected to electricity. But from 2013, and in only seven years, we have connected close to 3.5 million households, bringing the number of households connected to electricity close to 8 million. This means that we have done 15 times more than the previous administrations to connect our people to electricity. We take pride in this, not because we are better, but because we have to finish the business of our founding fathers in order to envision a new dream. And we take cognizance that we too shall not finish, but we shall also leave a foundation for future leaders to continue. If electricity and education reforms are supported to fight ignorance, our efforts to fighting disease are in the universal health care program. Our health care reforms are far beyond what our forefathers expected. We have not only dispatched sophisticated machinery to hospital across the countries, count, uh, counties in order to localize treatment and indeed, working together with county governments across the country, we have seek to improve our health facilities. But we have also made this treatment much more affordable through NHIF. And with upcoming reforms, we expect this to expand even more. We have done this because poor health has a way of indignifying people. But with treatment close by and cost reduced, a patient does not have to sell their property in search of good health. If this was a dream of our founding fathers, then it is our obligation to achieve it. The coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the urgency on this endeavor. And once again, I wish to give my thanks and indeed praise to our county governments who, with whom we have worked hand in hand in this endeavor. We need not be persuaded as a people why we must do everything in our power to conquer this invisible disease, this invisible enemy. But to do so and regain the ground we have lost we need to come together as a nation. Each of us is called to become a shuja against this disease. The containment measures and protocols issued by the government, while absolutely necessary, we also recognize, have constrained our freedoms. And indeed, as the Deputy President has just said, changed our way of life completely. I appreciate 
the anxiety that is weighing heavily on the minds of parents and children, particularly those preparing for the national exams. And I share the heavy hearts of all the faithful who can no longer congregate and share in worship of the Almighty. In this regard, and conscious of the emerging trend of infections, I am hereby directing that the Ministry of Education fast tracks and finalizes the ongoing consultations with all stakeholders that will provide us with an appropriate calendar for the gradual resumption of education in the country. The guidelines should also inclu include protocols to be followed by all learning institutions in order to guarantee not only the safety of our children, but the safety of their parents and grandparents. Two, that conscience of the fact that Kenya is a God-fearing nation. I have also directed the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Health, to continue and hasten their engagement with religious leaders across the country with the objective of developing protocols that will be adopted to guide a more participatory way of worship while guaranteeing the safety of worshipers. Fellow Kenyans, I also wish today, and on behalf of an internally grateful nation, to recognize and commend our healthcare workers for giving their all in support of our response to this pandemic. I also want to recognize our researchers and innovators, including the team of university students that designed and built a customized ventilator. The country is also indebted to the thousands of Kenyans who provided meals for our law enforcement manning checkpoints and our artists who raised awareness of the virus through their music and artwork. But we are also forever truly grateful for our men and women in uniform who have continued to work above and beyond the call of duty to keep us safe and to ensure that rules are followed. We also recognize and commend all those who have selflessly gener and generously supported the Coronavirus Response Emergency Fund from the co contribution of 500 shillings by a young 11-year-old called Zawadi Mtua to the Kenya Shilling's 300 million personal contribution from Dr. James Mwangi and his family. We applaud every single Kenyan from every facet of society who have donated foodstuffs, clothes, sanitary items, and other support items to the fund which have been channeled to needy and vulnerable Kenyans affected by this crisis. I thank, too, all our international development partners who have quickly responded to our needs during this difficult time. Indeed, to recognize and honor these Kenyans who have exhibited exemplary service, sacrifice, patriotism and heroism, and a high sense of civic duty in helping steer Kenyans through the current pandemic, and on behalf of an internally grateful nation, I have on this first day of June 2020 issued an executive order establishing a new national award and state commendation, the Presidential Order of Service, Uzalendo Award. The names of the inaugural recipients of this high national honor have been pub published in a special issue of the Kenya Gazette dedicated to them. Fellow Kenyans, I would like to end my address today by once again re-emphasizing the calling by our founding fathers that they went through the fire and yet founded a nation that we call Kenya today. Their voices are calling out to each and every one of us 
during this moment of uncertainty. And they are telling us to be our very best in our darkest moment, just as they were. They are telling us that they fought for the liberation war for over 40 years and it came to pass. We will fight the challenges that we are faced with today and this too shall come to pass.